So today we're going to be talking about injury limitation. And as you can see here by the first slide, uh, usually when this topic is discussed, we're talking about injury prevention. So we're going to go ahead and cross that out and make sure that we understand that we are only able to limit injury. We cannot prevent injury. Uh, if we are going to be active and athletic, uh, especially if we're going to try to compete, in injuries are going to happen. Uh, a lot of the things that we do that are sports driven or endurance sports driven are just not ideal human activities. So we're going to have breakdowns in the tissue, the joint, we're going to have traumas to the body. So realize that we can't prevent injuries. That is a fallacy we can only limit. Uh, and as we go through today's webinar, what I want to talk about is adaptation and appropriate adaptation, which allows us to avoid injuries as much as we can or minimize them as much as we can. Now, having a little fun here, something that we can't avoid are traumatic injuries. So things like, uh, say, if I'm a soccer player, I get a slide tackle to the knee or a football player, I dislocate a shoulder. Um, those acute injuries are true what we think of uh, a sports injury where we, we know that there's damage. We can look on an uh, advanced imaging MRI, CT scan, and see a tear in a ligament, a tendon, a muscle, see a broken bone. Uh, these are the rarity in endurance sports, which is what most of this webinar is geared towards. Um, even though this is an endurance event here this guy was going after, he, uh, he met head on with the uh, basically the hurdle right here. Uh, I, I think he actually popped up and did pretty good though. So it was pretty impressive. But what we usually see with runners and all endurance athletes, that could be cyclists, triathletes, um, whatever your sport of choice is, uh, is kind of a mantra like this. So you guys may have seen this uh, meme before, but this is literally the, the mindset that predominates the endurance athlete world. And that kind of a mindset leads to a, a cycle that is much like your uh, shampooing your hair, right? So we see on the back of the bottle, even though I've never done this, maybe uh, women out there, you actually take the advice, but lather, rinse, repeat. The next time that you do that, it's easier to uh, suds up the hair and that's called the shampoo effect. Now, this is what is in most of our chronic injuries. So what we used to deem chronic repetitive stress injuries or cumulative stress injuries, this shampoo cycle is what's going on. But what we're usually taught in school or what we read on the internet if we're an athlete out there is this typical um, injury cycle where we see cumulative injury cycle. So we're starting at the top and we see tissue trauma first. Uh, we see inflammation follows the trauma, maybe muscle spasm. We're, we're getting into adhesions maybe later on if we keep running through the cycle. Uh, as this goes, we see we alter neuromuscular control, so we, we, we move different. And then we end up with muscle imbalances as we compensate. Well, uh, this is not my opinion. This is based on research. We need to start crossing out some of these. So most of the time, especially in our endurance uh, population, we're not actually having tissue trauma. So this is a big point to emphasize because uh, we have been educated and told that we're very prone to injuries and that these muscle imbalances and the way we run and all these things can lead to injury. But we need to remember that um, humans have been around for a very long time. We're very robust uh, animals. Uh, we're a robust organism. It takes a lot to break us. So to think that we are always dealing with actual tissue trauma. So um, tendonitis, tendinosis, strains, sprains, things like this. Uh, research is proving that this is not the case, especially in endurance athletes. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to cross out some different things. So muscle imbalance. This has been proven time and time again to um, not that muscle imbalances can occur, but that they don't necessarily lead to injury. So there's a uh, possible correlation. Uh, but not a lot of causation. And that's those are two words that get mixed up quite a bit uh, nowadays in the sports world, especially around sports uh, research and exercise physiology. So just because we have a muscle imbalance, say the our quadriceps works a little more in our hamstring and our running gait, that does not mean that that's going to lead to a knee injury. Uh, so there's 
not been, I don't know if there's been any research shown that can prove that that's the case for an injury throughout the body anywhere. So we're going to get rid of that muscle spasm. So you will see muscle spasm following an acute injury. Think of uh, if you have a uh, lumbar disc issue, you're going to get muscle spasm. Say you uh, have an ankle sprain, a really bad ankle sprain, you're going to have muscle spasm around there to basically protect the joint. But that muscle spasm is rarely occurring in this cumulative injury cycle, right? And then adhesions. So I'm not going to dive into this too deep, but the research on adhesions, which adhesions, if you're unfamiliar with this term, an adhesion would be thought of as basically haphazardly uh, uh, distributed collagen and soft tissue. Uh, we sometimes may call it scar tissue, but basically we're going to think of adhesions as tissue that's tougher than it should be, maybe thicker than it should be. So therefore it doesn't move appropriately or doesn't move like it should. Um, the, the research showing that adhesions exist is very shaky. The research showing that we can actually affect adhesions through um, certain modalities and recovery devices, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is uh, shaky to non-existent at best. So when we cross all these things out, what we're kind of left with is inflammation, altered neuromuscular control, and cumulative injury. So we could actually start at any one of these points. So I could have altered neuromuscular control. So let's say that I have run five days in a row. And for whatever reason, my right ankle is getting a little bit tight. Now I'm going to have a lack of input or proprioception through that ankle, which is going to change how I move, which could create inflammation in almost any area of the body, which could lead to an injury. I could have a current injury, which is going to change how I move, which could create inflammation, which leads to an injury. Or I could have systemic or even joint inflammation, right? So if I have a chronic inflammatory state of the body, I am far more susceptible to injury because my tissues are not able to repair appropriately and on the timelines needed. Uh, but overall, what we need to start looking at is most of the time in our endurance population, we're seeing that injuries themselves are due to sensitization of the nervous system. And we're going to have first peripheral sensitization and then secondary central sensitization. And then they play off one another in that shampoo effect. So peripheral sensitization, most people that are runners realize that when you run, you do a lot of the same thing. So is your body does a lot of the same movement and is not challenged by different movements. So take the, the kind of marquee event of the marathon and think how many steps we would be taking in the marathon on a, a non-natural surface. Your nervous system may start to speak to you in terms of pain because it just thinks that you're doing too much of the same thing. So we're sensitizing tissues. Now altered neuromuscular control and inflammation can obviously jack up the sensitization. Now once we, once we have peripheral sensitization of nerves, tissue, uh, usually peripheral nerves or sensory nerves. So uh, think of uh, light touch, vibration, deep touch, uh, all of these things start to become sensitized. And then secondarily we'll get central sensitization or sense, uh, sensitive nervous system around the cord itself. Uh, this is basically making it easier to have pain at the areas where our brain or our motor cortex is picking up uh, possible uh, areas of injury. So at the cord level, now we make it easier to have that peripheral sensitization. They play off one another. So this is where we have to go. If we back up to that tissue trauma off the first kind of spur here on the injury cycle, we don't necessarily have to have tissue trauma and maybe more often than not, we're not having tissue trauma and that could lead to, you know, severe eight, nine, 10 out of 10 pain. Uh, but when we go to imaging, there's not a, a strong imaging correlate and we're not even discussing the fact that the level of imaging today, we may not be uh, able to accurately decipher what we're seeing on imaging as far as that correlates and causates to pain in the human body. So one more little chart here. So it's maybe hard to see the colors, but realize that as muscle, bone, ligaments, tendons, and cartilage go across the chart, so do the line graphs with them. And you can see that what this is looking at is time on the, the x-axis and adaptation, or, yeah, adaptation on the y-axis that as time moves on, we're looking at adaptation of these tissues throughout the body. And all of the tissues in our bodies are 
basically created through different types of collagen. And the way that we determine what type of collagen we lay down is basically how we spur fibroblasts or even stem cells. So if I put uh, certain kinds of forces through my knees as I learned to crawl as a kid, I'm going to form a kneecap. Um, if I have a, a graft of my hamstring put where I had a ruptured ACL and I go back and do imaging or even a arthroscopy two years later, I'm not going to have a piece of hamstring in there. I'm going to have an ACL. So things change based on force and the force applied to the tissue. So we can see here around 10 to 12 weeks, muscle spikes out on adaptation and it kind of flatlines. So we're going to adapt fairly quickly under muscle. And then as we go through the chart, you can see that tendons and cartilage are the last things to uh, hit an adaptation window. And that's peaking out around 110 weeks. So 110 weeks, right? So 52 weeks in a year. So we basically got almost two years and some change before our tendons and cartilage are adapting. And like I said in that uh, third slide, adaptation is the name of the game when it comes to injury limitation. So let's kind of brainstorm for a second about how our training plans surrounding endurance activities or any sport of our choice could be leading to injury and it's not necessarily the sport or the activity itself. So let's go back to that marquee event of the marathon. If I Google marathon training plan, most plans I'm going to get are going to be a 12 week plan. Um, there has been some exercise physiology that goes into why we have a 12 week plan, but for the most part, it's a, it's a three, three month lead up to a, uh, a big time event, which may allow us to do multiple marathons a year. So we have a three month cycle, we can de-cycle, come back, maybe do two or three a year. But in that 12 week cycle, what we're seeing is the only thing that's adapted unless we have a long term base of this athletic activity, so say I've been running for years, is muscle. Everything else is not quite at that adaptation level yet. And what do we see most runners dealing with? Uh, we see on this adaptation window that the, the least adapted would be cartilage and tendons. So think of your tendinosis, think of your meniscus issues. Um, and then we see ligaments and bones. So we see stress fractures. We see um, maybe we start stressing the MCL or the LCL. Um, we're just talking lower extremity here. But our adaptation training plan needs to be periodized over the course of weeks, months, and years. And periodized basically means we get to an adaptation level. So say I I go through a 12-week training plan, I may need to cycle back down um, to a lower level of effort rather than going right into the race. And then, but where I start, where I cycle back down is not where I began the first cycle. So I'm basically stair-stepping my way up that adaptation plateau. And that's why a lot of people say that it takes years to build a good aerobic base I would argue that we're not building maybe so much of a good aerobic base, but add basically allowing time for proper adaptation of all of the tissues to the body to the sport or activity of choice. So just some food for thought on that. So when we're talking injury limitation, here are the big pieces we need to explore. So sleep, cross training, recovery, the mental aspect, diet and hydration, shoes and we got some question marks we'll discuss that proper warm-up and technique so let's dive right into these so sleep again here's a very common mindset of runners run now sleep later and you can see that this uh this fellow right here did not get enough sleep because he uh he forgot to tie his shoe so he's definitely maybe going to go past that cumulative injury cycle right into an acute injury cycle when he trips and falls but why is sleep such a big deal well a fairly new research article i believe this came out two years ago looked at adolescent females ages 10 to 14 and the a lack of sleep so females who got below six hours of sleep a night that was the number one predisposing factor to stress fractures. So stress fractures are usually are deemed stress fractures because we believe that we're stressing the bone or the cortical aspect of the bone beyond its limitations. It's kind of interesting to think the name stress fracture may be idiosyncratic with the, the fact that we're stressing the whole body uh, via the lack of sleep to where we're not able to repair 
that bony matrix fast enough to keep, keep up with adaptation like we were speaking about in the previous chart. So lack of sleep is a big deal for repairing soft tissue and bone and other tissues of the body. Hormone regulation. So as we get proper sleep at night, we're going to have the ability to uh, basically uh, go through cycles that allow us to utilize cortisol and human growth hormone and insulin and all these things. And when we lack sleep, we start to throw these off and this can obviously decrease the ability to heal, decrease performance, um, all these things. As we said before, tissue healing. If I'm already dealing with an injury and I'm not getting enough sleep, good luck. Um, in our clinic, this is always one of the questions we ask on intake. Uh, how much sleep do you get and what's the quality of your sleep? Because we don't stand a chance at helping you with an injury if we're fighting what the human body needs most to allow itself to heal. Cognition. Uh, this is kind of a, a no-brainer, but you know, I'm sure from first-hand experience, that when you have a lack of sleep that you're going to suffer from a cognitive standpoint. Uh, proper or sharp cognition is a big deal for uh, basically determining how you feel um, during a run, which we'll talk about uh, why feel is so important a little bit later. Uh, we need to be able to perform at our jobs or at school or whatever we need to do, do throughout the day rather than our just uh, our hobby of running or cycling or swimming or triathlon or lifting weights um, unless you're so you know lucky enough to be a professional athlete, which at the end of the day, cognition is what it's all about. And then if you're lacking sleep, you may start to lack motivation. This could be a number of factors. Uh, first of all, you're just tired, so it's hard to get out of bed in the morning to train. Uh, lack in cognition may turn us towards other things to uh, basically detract or take away from the fact that we're lacking sleep. So we turn to stimulants. We, uh, you know, we may turn to coffee, which may, whatever it is, it may have a a basically downward spiraling effect where we we use these things temporarily to help us get through the training and then by the end of it we're, we're lacking motivation due to this overall lack of sleep. So a big one in my world is cross training and cross training can mean all sorts of things and what I would say is most of the time because this is geared a little more towards endurance athletes when we see endurance athletes uh, undergo cross training or they say they're cross training we see endurance athletes put in activities that require endurance or aerobic capacity for the cross training so we see a lot of runners that will go swim we see a lot of cyclists that will run we see a lot of swimmers that will you know cycle whatever it is but we see that kind of triathlon mentality uh, surrounding endurance sports but the importance of cross training really comes from imposing a different load on your musculoskeletal and nervous system. And what I mean by that is when you become really efficient in a movement. So if I've been running for years and I see that I've got a type typo there, guys, that nerves this system. Yeah, sorry about that. It'll drive me nuts if I didn't point it out. But uh, when we become really efficient in a movement, which that's the, the goal of most endurance activity is efficiency, right? Efficiency in energy systems and movement and game plan and everything. But when we become very efficient, our body starts to, uh, and maybe the nervous system starts to speak to, to us in terms of pain or um, fatigue, things like this, because again, our nervous system may be uh, basically putting out a warning light saying that if you keep doing this, you will get injured. You're becoming very, very efficient, but the efficiency is detracting from area, other uh, areas of your body, other movements, uh, other joints, what it, whatever it may be. And I mean, if you think about it from the most basic standpoint, obviously, as we become better endurance athletes, we will sacrifice strength. As we get better mitochondrial efficiency as an endurance athlete, we're going to lose more fast twitch ability as like a sprinter or a lifter. Um, and you can't work on all of these things at once and be the best at either one. But the, the goal is to impose a different load so that you're, you're basically interrupting or disrupting your body's and more so your nervous system's uh, kind of process of uh, economy as to not lead to maybe a false positive as far as pain goes. So we don't get those like false alarms. Um, we need to challenge patterns to optimize efficiency. 
right? So a lot of runners, a lot of cyclists, a lot of swimmers move through what's called the sagittal plane, so front to back. So a lot of our cross training should take place in the coronal or the frontal plane, so side to side or the transverse or rotational plane, because that's what we don't get a whole lot of in these sports. So we need to challenge the, again, the musculoskeletal and the nervous system in these these uh, planes of motion because as we become more efficient in one, we will detract from the other and eventually that may lead to an injury itself. We need adaptation to stressors. We went through the adaptation chart. Uh, again, adaptation, adaptation, adaptation is what this whole webinar is about. But the more that we load the nervous system in different ways and load the musculoskeletal system in different ways, it has to appropriately adapt and the more we can adapt to uh, random practice and random movement and apply that within our sport of choice, the happier our nervous system is going to be. So the mind side is a local uh, sports psychology group here in Birmingham, top notch, uh, very well known. So we're very lucky to have them here in Birmingham. But when we're talking about the mental aspect as it applies mainly to endurance sports, we need to talk about this idea of the central governor theory. And now this isn't, there's a lot more to the mental aspect, uh, you know, whether it's goal setting, motivation, uh, mindfulness, positivity, there's all of these things that are great, but I just want to touch on this. And this is a, a theory that was popularized by Tim Noakes, uh, Professor Tim Noakes, his PhD. But basically what this is saying is our, the fatigue that we experience during an activity, during a sport, during exercise, may be more in part due to perceived fatigue factors rather than actual fatigue. So let's talk about this for a second. So as my brain and different areas of my brain start to pick up uh, different metabolites and uh, changing chemistry within my body, whether that's the, the common ones you may have heard of, like lactic acid, or we start to get an increase in CO2, we get a decrease in O2 saturation. All of these things are kind of being monitored and registered by different areas of our brain. And what the central governor theory would say is, as our brain picks up these, these subtle cues, it's going to slowly shut down the body, which is in uh, stark contrast to what we used to think in the world of exercise physiology, where the body is actually shutting down, right? And this is uh, the best example of this, again, using uh, something like a marathon, is when we see somebody that looks like they are completely out of energy at mile 23, 24 of the marathon, and then the last half mile or the, that last two tenths of a mile can create a wonderful kick at a, you know, a, one, a 115, 400 pace or something like that. Like that is an illogical fallacy when we say, man, your body is just out of energy. You are truly fatigued, but then you can explode with this energy. And that's where we, this theory kind of came from is that a lot of mental training with endurance athletes is actually working on overriding these perceived fatigue factors in the central governor, which is your brain. And we won't go into exactly how we would do that, but a lot of the uh, ways that we do this in our practice and that is very popular with runners are your your high intensity interval sets or speed uh, you know track workout speed training because these are when we're pushing our bodies to the limit for short bouts uh, which we can't do all the time for long bouts of exercise so we can really push to what uh, is a popular term in the crossfit world that that dark place where we have to push beyond our comfort level push beyond what we're uh, we're familiar with and basically create some grittiness in our workout. So recovery, uh, this is something that has become very, very popular. And we see here the foam roller, the Normatec, or what a Normatec is pneumatic compression sleeves, the Mark Pro, which is basically a electronic vascular pump. Uh, there are numerous tools out on the market and what we need to realize with these is there are obvious benefits to a lot of these different uh, devices and uh, modalities and techniques but we want to we want to know what we're doing when we do these so whether it's foam rolling uh, pneumatic compression ice uh, electronic uh, pulsing most of the time we're trying to and this again endurance athletes but this isn't just endurance when we get into recovery Improve venous return. So very popular in runners. If you've ever been out to an Ironman, we see the tents that Normatec has set up with people 
kick back with their feet higher than their heart and they're in these big compression boots. And we're trying to improve venous return so we can basically uh, return all of these metabolites and all the waste materials that have been used back to the heart so we can recycle blood a little faster, which is going to help us recover. That makes sense. Same thing for lymph. So lymph is basically a fluid that moves through the body that's going to pick up waste materials. Uh, it helps uh, uh, when, and when we do have an injury, it's going to help bring the things that we need, take away the things that we don't need anymore, uh, a little bit different than blood, so it's moving different things. But there's also a lot of research looking at how lymph and uh, lymphatic stasis or the inability to move that lymph, especially post-exercise, can lead to pain itself. So it's a big deal to get this stuff moving, and that can be foam rolling. It could be, you know, Mark Pro. Uh, change of perception with DOM. So that's delayed onset muscle soreness. So when we get on a foam roller or lacrosse ball or whatever it may be when we're dealing with some muscle stiffness and soreness, we're going to override some of those perceptions, again, in that central governor in our motor cortex, which may allow us to move a little freer, walk a little more normal, which is a big deal because when we, if we go back to that cumulative injury cycle chart, if we're going to continue training after a hard bout of exercise where we have some soreness, which we're undoubtedly going to have as an athlete, we don't want to alter motor control too much because we will start moving different, which can lead to injury. So I really think um, this is a where these devices can be a big deal. Um, they get somewhat ridiculed, uh, around athletics and rehab and the movement world because some people say they're not doing anything. Um, what I would say is just like um, there's a, a lot of these same benefits can come through massage therapy, um, hands-on techniques. But if we don't alter that perception, we don't improve the perception that our brain is trying to relate to our body, we could start to move different, which can lead to um, altered running gait, altered cycling, uh, motions, altered swimmer, swimming stroke, like that's what we want to stay away from to make sure we're not falling into that injury cycle. And like I said, improve short-term range of motion. So one of the, the best things we can do after a, a race, a competition, a really hard training day is make sure that we move. That may even be later that day or it may be the next day. So we're not going from a complete uh, all out effort to a complete sedentary day because then we're going to have a lot of venous stasis. We're going to have a lot of lymphatic stasis. We're probably going to have more DOMS uh, and we're going to have more altered neuromuscular control. So we want to make sure that we're moving to, again, impose a load. So hopefully if we ran hard, say we did a marathon the day before, hopefully we're not running the next day. Maybe we go cycle, we pick up a kettlebell, we do yoga. We want to impose a different load. So both the, the musculoskeletal system reaps the benefits and the nervous system reaps the benefits. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard this term called runchies, but that's called the run munchies. And nutrition is a big deal, a big, big deal. And maybe even too big of a deal to bring up in a webinar like this because we could have a whole webinar on nutrition. But we have to discuss it as it applies to injury limitation because uh, like we said in that, cumulative injury cycle, um, inflammation and chronic inflammation can is one of the biggest predisposing factors. And your nutrition is what's going to fuel the system, but also offset some of these inflammatory reactions and states that we're going to deal with. So just some broad strokes, some guidelines here. So real food, close to source, locally grown. So what's that mean? If you're going to eat stuff, try to limit processed food. Um, there's a lot of things that our body is not able to deal with from a, a evolutionary standpoint that we're using in our foods these days. Close to the source. So if I am eating a, you know, if I'm eating a steak, I'd rather have it, you know, a grass-fed, uh, non-GMO, non-antibiotic uh, piece of beef because that's the most are the closest to what we've been eating for the longest period of time. So it's probably the easiest for our body to handle, um, which is going to make our body and our genes and overall our performance much happier and locally grown. Uh, it's good for your health and it's also good for the economy, guys. So that's my little two cents on that. Anti-inflammatory. So we could go through a whole list of foods that are inflammatory. We could go through a whole list of foods that are anti-inflammatory. Realize Inflammatory foods are the main culprits here are going to be um, 
things that are very high in uh, rancid or fast oxidizing oils. So vegetable oil is nasty. Uh, we want a good balance of omega-3 to omega-6. So we don't want to be doing too much, again, vegetable oil, corn oils, things like that. Uh, lots of fruits, lots of dark greens, going to be anti-inflammatory. One of the biggest inflammatory agents out there is sugar. Um, sugar gets hidden uh, the way we define it, whether that's high fructose corn syrup or just plain cane sugar. But sugar is uh, uh, can be pretty nasty and can wreak havoc, especially when it comes to a high-end athlete. Now, when we're talking about calories, we need to talk about quantity and quality. So isn't it, again, any kind of athlete, but in the endurance world, we need to make sure that we're getting adequate calories. Uh, a lot of people maybe sometimes get into endurance sports, whether it's running, cycling, swimming, uh, to lose weight. And sometimes we can go too far one way and we become too calorie conscious and that can uh, wreak havoc as far as the body itself goes, but obviously lead to injury if you don't have the calories to repair the tissues as you're breaking them down. But also quality of calories, which goes back to the first bullet point here of real food, close to the source, locally grown. But also quality in terms of are you getting enough of each type of calorie so calories can be broken down into basically four categories so we've got fat protein carbohydrates and then um, basically we, we could add like a sugar or an alcohol in there but we need to make sure we're getting enough and as an endurance athlete it's important to get enough good carbs and there's a lot of different stuff we could talk about here we're going to kind of take it easy broad strokes give you some good guidelines uh, macro versus micronutrients. So what's this mean? So macro would be our, like we said, protein, carbohydrates, fats. Micronutrients would be all of the, the vitamins and minerals and things that we need to be getting out of these foods. If we focus on that first uh, bullet point, we'll realize that it'll be a lot easier to get those micronutrients and we can avoid supplements as much as we, we can. Uh, it's not that supplements are bad. I supplement with a few things here and there. But supplements are just that. They're supposed to supplement the diet. So if we have a pretty good diet, and this gets said a lot, that the, the SAD diet, the standard American diet, is always going to need supplementation because we can not simply get what we need from the, our diet these days, no matter how well we eat. There may be some truth to that, but we can get pretty darn close, and we should try to get pretty darn close because, again, when we get our micronutrients from our food, that is the way that our body is designed to get them. So it is much easier on our body and it's going to allow us to perform better. And that's what this whole webinar is about. So I felt like this a couple times in the heat of the uh, Alabama summer. So let's talk about hydration really quick. Again, this is kind of like nutrition. We could have a whole webinar on hydration. But let's hit a couple of the big bullet points. You guys have probably heard some of this. About a half. To three quarters of your body weight in ounces per day. Uh, I would say it's closer to a half for somebody that is uh, not exercising that much, maybe more sedentary. Um, and this is going to go down as we age, actually. Uh, and then three quarters of your body weight a day in ounces for an athletic individual. Electrolytes are a big deal, and a lot of people know that we need them during exercise. You also need them during the day. So if we are going to do three quarters of our body weight in ounces per day, so say we're taking in 120 ounces of fluid or 100 and we're not adding any electrolytes to that throughout the day, you're going to start bolusing the kidneys. So basically you're going to start just peeing out your water. So you need electrolytes. So that's sodium chloride, potassium, to be able to extract the water that we're drinking back into the extracellular matrix. And if you don't do that, you're just gonna make your kidneys work harder, which we don't wanna do, and you're not going to be any more hydrated than you should be. Uh, now, the kinds of electrolytes do matter. Uh, there are a lot of very popular brands, Gatorade, Powerade, all these things that have been marketed as very good uh, electrolyte or electrolyte replacement drinks out there that are very high in sugar content. And the funny thing about sugar is um, it's inflammatory and it can be a, a dehydrating factor in our diet. So when we put too much sugar into these drinks, we can actually have the exact opposite effect we're looking for. The other thing with these drinks is there's a lot of non-natural things in these um, that makes it hard for your body to um, absorb or deal with or just not good for you overall. So find good sources. I'm not going to talk about any specific brands, but there's some really good sources that are out there on the market these days. Um, look for daily versions, or we could just be as easy as throwing some sea salt into your water. And uh, 
you know, we need to obviously surrounding exercise. We need a little bit more, a little bit different concentrations versus the day. Uh, now, saying that not all water is created equal, again, could be a whole webinar. But when we say this, um, in our water nowadays, we deal with a lot of uh, hormones, uh, estrogens, and antibiotics, and all sorts of toxins due to uh, basically these things entering our water system and then us not having the ability to properly, properly filter them out or they're not being filtered at all. And then when we get in home filters, so think of your filters on your refrigerator or under the sink or a Brita filter is usually a, a, a pretty decent carbon filter, but that basically gives you water that we would call net neutral. So water should have some baseline minerals in it. And when we go through a carbon filter, we basically eliminate almost everything, which if we don't have those, those electrolytes and minerals in the water, that water is net neutral and actually can make your body work harder to maintain the water and pull more water out of your body than it's putting in. Um, that can be uh, spoken about on the same terms as t uh, drinking a lot of distilled water. So that's net neutral water. So as easy as it is, you can throw a little sea salt in there. You can throw a little sea salt in your water in a glass container, set it in the sun. You're going to get a catalyzing reaction where you get a lot more minerals in that water. Uh, again, we could talk about water for days, but those are really good guidelines. Shoes. This is not an ad for ultra shoes, but it is a very good image to look at. Um, most Americans are in a shoe, and we'll come back to this image, that are one and a half times too small for them. And this isn't looking at length. This is usually looking at width. So when we go into a running shoe store or any store, a department store, shoes are going to come off of the shelf in a, a D width, which is your standard width. And then we go to E, double E, and then it goes up from there. Um, Americans are getting bigger and bigger and the shoe width is staying the same. And most Americans do not want to take the time or spend the money to special order shoes, which leads to them putting their foot into a shoe that's going to basically squeeze the metatarsal, squeeze the foot together. And when we do that, we're going to alter one of those things we talked about a couple times, neuromuscular control via the dampening effect of uh, limiting proprioception. Uh, proprioception is basically position sense. And our feet are very, very important for this because we have on average anywhere from seven to 8,000 free nerve endings in the bottom of the foot. So we're looking for a lot of feedback from a neurologic standpoint through our feet. Very big deal for our athletes that are runners, whether you're a sprinter or a long distance runner. So a properly sized shoe is going to allow that foot to react and react more like a foot should. So like we said, we need to concentrate on width and sometimes it does take a special order, but also realize as we get older, our foot is going to get wider as our ligaments become more lax. Women post-pregnancy are going to have a wider foot. So we want to make sure that we're taking that into account and the best way to measure your foot is still our old school um, Brannock device with the sliding rails where we can measure uh, foot length and width. Uh, a lot of these scanners that are out there these days uh, are not quite as accurate actually as the old Brannock device. Largest study to date on shoes was done by the U.S. Army. It had over 600 soldiers and in this study they tried to, they had a couple different groups. Uh, certain groups they looked at walking gait and tried to correlate the proper shoe to a certain kind of walking gait, whether they pronated or supinated. Uh, and then another group basically got to uh, fit their shoe just based on what felt best to them. And there was an overwhelming st statistical significance showing that the group that based their shoe fit on comfort and not on the proper shoe based on gait analysis or a fallen arch or so basically either static or dynamic posture, uh, the group that was based off comfort had improved performance and decreased injuries both versus the other group saw either a, a baseline, so no change or increase in injuries and decrease in performance overall. So the, the take home advice here, even if you get fitted by a, a shoe professional at a shoe store and the shoe doesn't feel right to you, you need to look for a shoe that is comfortable. And a lot of that has to do with the width of the shoe nowadays. Running surface. 
So I always kind of say that running shoes get marketed to us very much. I think it's around $8 billion a year gets spent in the shoe market on marketing and um, distribution. So shoes get blamed for a lot of injuries, and they also get looked at as the savior for a lot of injuries, but a lot of that's just not true. Now, what is important when we're looking at shoes is the surface upon which we're going to be using them. I think it makes sense to most people. We would not run in a, uh, a track sprinting spike for a marathon, and we would probably not use a Hoka to run a 100-meter dash. Um, so if I'm going to run a very mountainous, rocky surface, I want a shoe that's going to have some grip. If I'm going to run a road marathon, I probably want a regular running shoe. If I'm going to be sprinting, I probably want a, a minimalist shoe so I can feel the track and get some spring out of my foot. So let's poke a little fun at runners again. I run to warm up to run. Uh, most runners, uh, you can raise your hand silently in front of your computer at home if this is you, run to warm up for their run. Uh, the warm up is crucial for a lot of reasons. Let's just dive into this. So we're going to increase core temperature. So as we increase core temperature, we make it easier to oxygenate the muscles, get blood moving, get that lymph moving, make it easier for the venous blood to return. Uh, during the warm up, we're going to increase CO2 tolerance. So what that means is the the area in your brainstem that registers um, how much breath you need to take to basically keep yourself going. Uh, is regulated not off, not off oxygen, but off CO2. So as we warm up, we want to basically reduce your O2 saturation. And that may seem counterintuitive, but as you, if you had a little pulse oximeter on your finger, as you reduce your O2 saturation, that is a good thing because that means you're offloading oxygen from the red blood cell um, into the system. Now, if I increase my CO2 levels or I sorry increase my O2 saturation then that means that I'm hanging on to the O2 and I am less efficient which is not what we're looking for. Improve joint range motion proprioception so going through a dynamic warm-up so we're loading the joints we're going through big range of motion so we can prepare the body to put in some work at a decent level of effort and then probably the biggest issue of all is working on our issues. So if I know I have a stiff ankle, I know that I got a cranky hip, I know that I, um, I don't breathe that well in the first mile to two miles of my run, that warm-up is when we should be working on those issues. And your warm-up acts as diagnostics and troubleshooting. So what I mean by diagnostics is I go through my dynamic warm-up, I should be moving through every joint of my body, um, uh, through controlled ranges of motions, and if I feel some pain, well, now I can work on that joint or that area a little bit more. And if I don't work out that kink, that may be an indicator of how I'm going to alter training that day. If I can work out the kink, I can maybe stay right on course. So again, diagnostic and troubleshooting. But without the warm up, the run becomes all of it. Your basically your diagnostics, your workout, your troubleshooting, and that can end up not being a whole lot of fun. So as we come towards the end here, we're going to kind of get into more specifics and I, we have to ask the question, can you run? And this could also say, can you cycle? Can you swim? Can you lift weights? Uh, and what I mean by this is, do you have the, the capability, right? Or sorry, do you have the ability to be capable of running? And what does that exactly mean? And we just show Meb here. Uh, Meb is showing us some good ranges of motions through the human body. Uh, so obviously we know that we need certain things. What do we need? So there's certain ranges of motions. We need certain amounts of hip flexion, extension, ankle dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, knee flexion, knee extension. We need to be able to breathe appropriately. All of these things, we need balance. We need uh, good vision. We need, there's so many things that we need. And if we're lacking any of these, it makes no sense to go out and challenge the, the, the body, the musculoskeletal and nervous system in a way that we can almost assured is going to lead to injury. So how do we appropriately uh, determine this? And this would be, could be done in the warm up. This could be uh, how I cross train, that I'm challenging my body in different ways to make sure that I have appropriate ranges of motion, that I can control those ranges of motion. 
Um, it could be working with a, uh, a coach or a movement professional. And then I have to reiterate this to many, many of my clients that what you gain in neuromuscular efficiency, you will not lose in aerobic capacity. So many a runner has come to me that is suffering from an injury or a running technique issue. And sometimes when we're trying to upload new software to the human body, it's easier to take out the standard operating procedure, the standard operating software of the exercise of choice for that time because it's just easier for us to create a new pattern or a new movement pattern. And when we don't do that, it's just going to take longer. So if we can get a runner that's got a, a technique fault that is truly going to be detrimental because we're not saying that just because something doesn't look right, it, it's not going to be uh, effective, right? I'm sure you've seen runners out there that don't look like they're running all that hot or extremely effective. But when we have a runner that we, we've deemed that we want to change something in their gait or we need to change something because it's leading to injury, the time that we take off, what we'll gain in efficiency, so think of improving the efficiency of the mechanics, we will not lose and we will probably actually gain aerobic capacity. So as the machine works better, the engine gets to offload its basically workload. The foot strike myth, and we have to talk about this when, it's talking, when we're talking about running technique, and this basically, uh, and I, this maybe got very popular, became very popular when uh, the book Born to Run came out and we saw uh, the researchers out of Harvard and different places, biomechanics labs, put out research looking at forefoot strike versus heel strike and that there was uh, muscular economy and reduced injury with this. Well, uh, one of the bigger studies that looked at forefoot, forefoot versus rear foot strike showed that if you're not running faster or as fast as a 6.30 per uh 630 minute per mile pace that you may be more efficient probably are more efficient and going to have less injuries as a heel striker um, and the faster we run you're going to naturally be up more on midfoot and forefoot so again what I suggest to my runners all the time is don't worry about what what part your foot is landing on the ground let's get the mechanics upstream appropriate so that hip flexion hip extension knee uh, ankle, let's get all those working appropriately and our foot strike will follow suit. Um, so the downstream's effect has to be looked at upstream first. Otherwise, we could be uh, kind of falsely putting our foot in a position that it's not able to handle, which can lead to injury 100%. So let's say we have issues in these areas. What can we do? Um, and this is usually, this is mainly talking about movement. So we want to create buffers. So let's say for a runner that we know we need around 10 degrees of hip hyperextension. But when I try to extend my hip actively and passively, I only get 5 degrees. So what that means is that I'm maxing out my hip extension with every swing phase of my running gait. And when I max out range of motion on a joint, muscle, tendon, ligament, cartilage, you can almost rest assured you're going to run into injury. So when I create buffers, we're trying to create a bigger range of motion than I need so that I, I can be stronger, I can be I can last longer, I have more endurance, I'm not taxing the musculoskeletal system or nervous system in that range of motion, which is going to allow me to do it for a lot longer period of time and a lot stronger. But if we're going to work on these things, we need to make sure we have adequate range of motion first. So can I get my hip into 10 degrees of hip extension? Once you can, you need to be able to control that. So that's where we start loading it. So we move maybe away from things like passive holds, like yoga, stretching, to loading the system. Maybe if we're talking about the hip extension, we're going into uh, deep lunges, split squats, things like that. And then adequate time for adaptation. So once I, can, I have the range of motion, I can control it. Have I allowed my body to go through the, uh, the necessary timetable to make sure the tissues that are appropriate for that range of motion have ad adapted as so that I won't lead to injury. And we're not saying that we need a full two years of adaptation. We just need to make sure that we have time under tension or time under duress to allow ourselves both neurologically and also from a tissue standpoint to change. And a really smart guy named Dr. Andrew Ospina, a sports chiro out of Canada, came up with this little chart that basically explains what we're looking at when we deal with injuries in the sporting world. 
So when load is greater than capacity, we have an injury. So if I've done too much, I've done too much too soon, I have a blow to the side of my knee, I lift up too much weight that I can't handle, I'm going to have injury. When load is less than capacity, that's what we're doing in the rehab world. So when we have to fix something, we have to obviously build you back up. When capacity is greater than load, we have prevention. And like I said, I would cross out prevention and say limitation. But what that what that really means is, is when my capacity, so my that can mean aerobic capacity, my tissue capacity, my ability to lift a certain amount of weight is greater than the, the, the task at hand, I'm going to be safer than I would have been. Pretty simple stuff. Um, here's just some fun quotes for the same, same guy. Uh, basically make, we'll say, stuff work nice. So if you have a joint that doesn't move like it should to do whatever activity you're trying to do, whether you're trying to do a uh, military press or sprint or jump or swim, uh, you need to make sure that your shoulder and your hip and your ankle can do the things that are necessary for that sport of choice. And if they can do that, you need to make sure you can control those things, which comes through uh, technique and mechanics and uh, cross-training and all of these things. Because if you can't control it and you can just get there passively, or if we haven't trained her under enough duress, then good luck. And we could even take this so far as to look at uh, diet. We could look at the mental side of things. We could look at sleep. So this control yourself, uh, it, it goes beyond just movement. Last little quote by Dr. Spina, uh, joint independence before joint interdependence. So simply put, joint integrity precedes activation. And what, what do I mean by that? So if my ankle cannot move appropriately to be a runner so I don't I only have 10 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion or shin towards toes then I'm going to challenge that dorsiflexion immensely by trying to run and my ankle may not be the thing that pays the price it may be my knee it may be my hip who knows um, but before we build a big pattern like running we want to make sure that we have uh, adequate mobility and control at the joints that would be necessary for that activity I'm sure you've all heard this uh, quote before, adapt and overcome. I'm not exactly sure where it came from. I, it may be General Patton. I don't know. But I would like to change a little bit and say adapt and overcome injury. So when we allow for proper adaptation through everything that we've talked about, uh, how we sleep, how we eat, how we hydrate, how we cross train, how we train, um, and then the ability to do our sport of choice with buffers, we can't adapt, we cannot overcome injury best we can. And like I said, there's no prevention, only limitation. I really appreciate you guys joining me on this webinar. If you have any questions or you want to follow me on social media, here's my email address, drbobeard at gmail.com. Social media, so Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at drbobeard. Thank you guys so much.